Mack. I am the Associate Director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture and the Director of the Yale Youth Ministry Institute. And if you're getting food, please stay getting food. That's an important part of our hospitality. If you're eating, please continue to eat. I just want to share some thoughts with you while we await the, uh, being joined by our YouTube live audience and begin our lectures for today. The first thing I want to say to each of you who are engaged in youth work is thank you. We have many, many different things we're hoping to contribute in the course of the Yale Youth Ministry Institute's work, but certainly one of the most important things is to thank you for what you're doing with the youth of our state and our region and our world, and to thank you and put you together with other people who share your passion for youth work, both those that you came with from your communities and your churches, and those who you've never met before. I hope you'll always look at these luncheons as an opportunity to meet new folks from different contexts, to make connections, to learn with and from one another, to find ways to unite your youth groups for shared activities, etc. We're just glad to do this to express our gratitude for what you want and to facilitate the development of a community. We all know how beautiful wonderful, stimulating, life-changing youth ministry can be. We also know how challenging, heartbreaking, underpaid, did I say that, underpaid, and isolating youth work can be. So let this be a place where at least as to the isolation uh, and the underappreciation, we celebrate what you're doing. The second thing I wanna say is uh, that I hope you will not only understand if this is your first time here today, this is our seventh year of monthly lunches and lectures. We, we sponsor a lecture like this the first Wednesday of every single month and we have since 2012. And the only exception is January where I don't think you're gonna come out to a lecture on January 2nd, so we kick it back uh, a week or two so that you can join us. I want to call your attention to three little pieces of paper that are our propaganda in your folders. The first of them is the flyer for next month's lecture. We have a really extraordinary lecture coming our way next month by David Anderson Hooker, professor from Notre Dame, and his colleagues, Dr. Atari Toure and Dr. Elizabeth Corey. Dr. Hooker is one of our leading scholars in the country on peacemaking and reconciliation. And could there ever be a time when we are more in need of that kind of guidance with our youth, along with the subject that we're addressing today? So uh, we are already ordering the good food to feed you, the room to welcome you, and the lectures to inform and enrich your ministries. I hope you'll join us. The other thing I want to show you is our flyer for the entire fall's activities, which will describe not only today's lecture and next month's lecture, but our December lecture is Dr. Miroslav Wolf, the director of our Yale Center for Faith and Culture on forgiveness. So I hope you'll ring circle your calendars for the first Wednesday in December as well. And one last public service announcement. Inside your folders, you'll see our social media pages. We've been doing this for seven years, so we have 80 full lectures, 800 interview clips, which we curate and every month Every week, we have a different theme on our Facebook pages, and they're called Kernels of Content from Yale. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, there'll be a theme, leading worship, organizing uh, communal prayer, pastoral care, training volunteers, pick a theme, and Monday and Wednesday and Friday, one of the scholars' video clips is posted. You know, we have 10,000 people around the world following these videos, and we have Facebook pages not only for our domestic audience, we have Polish language pages, Korean language pages, Spanish language pages, Portuguese language pages, an Africa page, we have 2,600 youth ministers following our kernels of content. So please join or like our Facebook pages or other social media so you can receive not only our announcements of what's coming, but also the kernels of content from Yale. And now I have the happy duty of asking for a blessing over our food and proclaiming our spiritual powers extend to retroactive grace, would you join me in prayer? Uh, God of creation and provision, we thank you for the food that is before us and within us. 
We thank you for your spirit moving through our communities and calling folks forward to minister with and for our youth. And we thank you for your spirit moving through hearts of youth workers, giving them the faith to respond and the courage to minister to young people in difficult and challenging times. We ask you to bless all the folks here in this room in their ministries. Be a source of renewal and strength that moves through them into the communities they serve. Keep us mindful of those today who cannot be with us and who may have too little or none to eat. And give us tender hearts to care for them in your name. We ask for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to introduce to you the coordinator of our Yale Youth Ministry Institute activities, a really terrific experienced youth minister and second year student here at Yale Divinity School to introduce our speaker, Jonah Heiser. Hello everyone and welcome to our first Why Am I Lunch and Lecture of the year. It is so good to once again see this room full of people dedicated to and passionate about youth ministry and we are so happy for, to bring you this lecture today. Um, I had the great joy of getting to know these three gentlemen some over the past two days and um, I'm really excited for the wisdom that they'll be sharing with us today. Dr. Frank Rogers is the Muriel Bernice Roberts Professor of Spiritual Formation and Narrative Pedagogy at the Claremont School of Theology. He's also the co-director and founder of the Center for Engaged Compassion. Among his many writings, he has written Practicing Compassion, Compassion in Practice, The Way of Jesus, Finding God in Graffiti, Empowering Teenagers Through Stories, and many other wonderful books. The Reverend Dr. Christopher Carter is an, the Assistant Professor of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of San Diego. His research interests include black and womanist ethics, environmental ethics, and animals and religion. He's also an associate pastor in the United Methodist Church. And Dr. Seth Shane is a practical theology PhD with a focus in spiritual formation, uh, dealing with issues of racial identity. So I'd like to welcome these speakers now. Well, thank you, Jonah and Skip, and uh, thank you to all of you for inviting us into these conversations. Uh, we're here to talk about race, and specifically compassion-based ways of engaging young people in conversation around race. Race goes deep, of course. It is in the core of who we are, and the dynamics of race are in every stitch of the social fabric that we live in, usually in ways that do not promote human flourishing. And as such, it is activating, it is frustrating, it is polarizing and difficult to talk about. And yet, we have to. It is essential that we as a nation begin to explore race more deeply. I see racism, as the primal trauma, or in theological language, the original sin on which this country was founded. The blood of native peoples is in the soil on which we built a nation, and the horrors of slavery is what contributed to developing this nation. And as such, when any trauma is not acknowledged and repaired, as the Hebrew Bible says, it bleeds into every single generation that follows, and it is here with us today. As Tahanisi Nahisi Coates says, racism is the toxic sludge that seeps into the water table from which all of us drink and which all of us are contaminated. And young people know this as well. So it is my privilege to be able to work with these two colleagues who are exploring very liberative ways of engaging in conversations about, around race. I've been asked to say a few words about why are we talking about this in a project that's dealing with joy and the good life. My work is in compassion, researching how compassion is cultivated and the role of compassion in social change. So let me say a few words about how I see compassion and joy being interconnected and how they relate to race. 
So the project's definition of, of joy is joy is what we experience when we're living a good life, a faithful life, and things are going well. It is a spiritually vibrant way that we respond to the gifts and blessings of life. So say in the matter of race, we belong to a community where we are treated as beloved, people of infinite worth in every dimension of our being. Say that we are bestowed with dignity and pride in our cultural identity and our racial identity, that we are emboldened to discover our own unique gifts, to find meaningful work in the world, nurture relationships across racial lines that are heard and honoring of each other, that we encounter systems and institutions that not only ha we have access to, but they actually celebrate our cultures and our races and empower us and equip us and our communities to flourish in the world, what a great world that would be. And we would feel joy. It would be an authentic response to that. And that resonates with our own understanding of joy. Joy is the affective experience. It's our own emotional response when our embodied reality, including our racial identities, are welcomed as beloved, are bestowed with dignity, and are living in communities and structures where the equitable flourishing of all is sustained, then we experience joy. The project says that joy is multidimensional. It's perceptual. In other words, that we take the time to notice the care, the support, and the empowerment that comes to us. It is emotional. We are emotionally attuned to the good things that happen in our lives. We savor the care. We, we are moved with gratitude. We absorb the vitality of living in such glorious communities. And we are active in ways to sustain our flourishing and, and to expand the circle of those who are invited to flourish as well, creating the conditions for all to be able to flourish. Joy would be a natural response to that. It's the heartbeat of a healthy human spirit savoring and thriving when life is going well. So what if life's not going so well? Say in racial matters, we have people in our communities that are feeling denigrated and even assaulted by virtue of racial identity, who are internalizing shame about who they are. We have relationships in a multiracial racial world that are characterized by fear, by suspicion, by hostility, by prejudice. We have social systems that privilege some and disenfranchise other trying to sustain our lives and find meaningful work. What about when people are suffering? Well, we suggest that in the same way that joy is the way a faithful life would respond when things are going well, compassion is what a faithful life responds when things are going poorly, when people are suffering. And we root this theologically in a sacred God who embodies compassion, whose heart breaks for oppression, and who yearns for a world where the dignity of all is allowed to flourish. We define compassion as being moved in one's depths by another's experience and responding in ways that intend to ease suffering and promote flourishing. Like joy, it is multidimensional. It involves perception. It takes the time to see another in their experience, to listen to their story, to see their pain, to hear the indignities and challenges that they are facing in a world that is already bleeding by virtue of race. It is emotional. It is an emotional attunement with the pain and suffering in the world, moved by another's experience, that starts to get just a little bit about the suffering that another endures and aches for that pain, grieves for the legacy of, race, of racism in our world, yearns that they flourish and celebrates when they are able to know joy in their lives. And it is active. It responds in ways that try to preserve the dignity of all, that tries to build relationships of authenticity and truth-telling, and that creates a world of structures that allow the flourishing of all people. So compassion is structured very similarly to joy and has an intimate and unique relationship to joy. If joy is the pulse beat of a spiritually vibrant heart responding to the good things in life, compassion is the pulse beat of a spiritually vibrant heart responding to the suffering of life. They are two sides of the same coin, two dimensions of the same pulse of a healthy human heart. 
Compassion is the downbeat of pathos in any experience of joy. As long as we live in a suffering world, joy must have an underbelly, underbelly of pathos and compassion. We could savor the delights and the good things in our life, but we should also have a soberness that recognizes that not all people have access or are privileged with the same dignity that we have been bestowed in those particular moments. That without the downbeat of compassion, joy becomes sentimental, becomes superficial, it becomes myopic and dismisses the suffering that is in our world, and it inadvertently perpetuates the systems that give rise to suffering, including racism. On the other hand, joy is the upbeat of restorative promise in any act of compassion. Compassion also has an element of joy within it. Not joy in suffering. Not even that suffering might give rise to some life lessons in the future. Absolutely not. Abuse in all of its forms is horrific and it is a violation to take any joy in, it of, in and of itself. However, when people are met in their suffering, when people have compassionate presence that sees and hears, help them feel that they are not alone in the world, something is restored in the human spirit. Some spark of new life emerges and a person is able to access resilience that endures suffering and a power that emboldens them to rise up in the midst and preserve their own dignity and claim that. Some hope can be kindled as well that would not only help them claim their own personal flourishing, but live toward a world for the flourishing of all. It is not joy in all of its glory, hardly. It is just a whisper. It's a subtle upbeat of restorative presence within compassion that sustains us when we are suffering and reconnects us to that sacred source from which all flourishing emerges. So the heartbeat of a good life, of a faithful life, beats with both joy and compassion, responding to the good with a sober joy, responding to suffering with a hopeful compassion. How does this play out in the dynamics of race is the rest of this morning's presentation. <laughs> I don't know if that was applause for what he said or applause because I got up, so I'm just going to assume maybe you pretend it was for me. Um, no, I'm just playing. Now, Frank uh, has deeply inspired <coughs> both Seth and I and our work. Sorry if this is uh, coming in and out. What I want to build upon what uh, Dr. Rogers said is the ways in which we understand joy and compassion to be intimately connected. The heartbeat, right, off of each other. And in this sense, we want to build upon our understanding of joy as an affective affirmation of our concrete reality by recognizing in this sense that for us, joy is an embodied experience, right? It's an embodied experience, meaning that with regards to race, what I'd like to suggest, as Dr. Rogers alluded to, is that certain groups and certain people have had privilege to not only uh, experience joy, but to actually express their joy in places that make them feel comfortable, places where they are allowed to, whereas other communities, other people, other groups, have had to confine their expression of what joy might be for them to particular kinds of social norms developed around dominant cultures of whiteness. And so in this sense, what we want to suggest today is that joy in America has a deeply racialized component. Has a deeply racialized component because not all people of color are allowed to express. We chuckle, but we know this is a part of the culture that, that we are allowed as people of color to exist within a certain realm, right? in terms of our affective expression. And so in this sense is how, why we are arguing and suggesting that joy is an embodied experience. And so we want us to perhaps 
widen our understanding of joy to also include the Christian dimension of allowing ourselves to be seen as the children of God, to seeing the image of God inside of us, right? That way in which we understand ourselves to be created in the image of God that gives us permission to love ourselves in all the ways that we can. And again, not everybody's been allowed to do that. And so in this sense, if joy is wrapped up in an aspect of affirmation of concrete realities, if our concrete reality is, a, a, from a Christian perspective, a, a part of embodying the Imago Dei, we think that joy, as it relates to conversations and, and, and encounters with regards to race, as it has been expressed historically, represents often a broken theological anthropology. And by this, I just mean the God, human, 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 and human nature relationship. And so when the human is defined in normative white terms, that is the definition by which people are allowed to express joy. And so often joy is wrapped up in a broken and shattered theological anthropology. And so a part of our goal, a part of the chapter that we wrote is to really begin to repair this God, human, human, human and human nature relationship with regards to people being able to both experience and express joy. Why is this important for youth? Youth long to be seen in their authentic self. If joy has a performative dimension, youth are often told that in order to, to, to fit into this particular kind of culture, to get, fit in as a, a Christian, you'd have to look a certain way, be a certain way, and act a certain way. And while maybe there are half-truths in some of that, we want to give young people the opportunity, the space, to express and explore who they are today, in this moment, with regards to their own racialization, with regards to their identity in community. And this is a blessing, this is a privilege, right? To be able to do this at this time in our country in a sacred space such as a church. And so this is why I believe, we believe that this is important for youth pastors, right? As, a, as an assistant pastor, as an as, as a, uh, MDiv graduate, someone who sees my call distinctly to serve the church, and the academy, I don't necessarily distinguish between those two, I believe we have a vocational responsibility as Christians to love God, neighbor, and self, right? And so how we go about doing this, this loving of neighbor, this loving of God and loving of self is how we go about expressing the joy that we have been discussing this morning, this afternoon. The challenge of our project, the challenge of what we're talking about today is that it requires risk. For people of privilege and for people of color, it requires risk to engage in conversations. When people approach you to discuss race, it is a risk of faith to have this conversation because we don't have to. People of privilege don't have to talk about this. Black people, we may be tired of talking about this. But as Frank said, we have no choice. I would suggest that the church is complicit in this historical And so it is our responsibility to begin to have conversations so we can begin to heal. And these conversations need to be grounded in compassion. Now, the difficult part about having the conversations is that often in, in, in our process, what's going to come up is there's going to be a time when you have to discern and begin to uh, learn things about yourself that, that are uncomfortable, regardless of your racialization. And so in our vocational responsibility to love God and neighbor, there's also a part where we have to love ourselves. And, and what's going to come up is perhaps some parts of you that you don't like. Like, it's easy for me to love the part of me that is the first in my family to go to college, to have my PhD. You know, I love, you know, just, just all, I don't want to brag, but you know, there's stuff about me that I like. I like I'm six foot tall, you know, that's kind of cool, you know. Used to be good at basketball. I love that stuff. But there's parts of me that I don't like. And those parts often are wrapped up in the ways in which race and racism have embedded in my soul. And so what compassion allows us to do is to love those parts too. Compassionately, such that they can begin to heal and allow us to be transformed within so that we can transform communities, right? 
And this isn't easy, but it's important. And this is why for us, we see joy and compassion intimately connected. So how do we do that? How do we begin cultivating compassion? We begin by, don't just do something, sit there. Oh, did I not skip again? Sorry, this is, this is kind of new to me, so bear with me. We'll be all right. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. Don't just do something, sit there. And for us, this points to the reality that cultivating compassion takes sustained time and effort, especially in di with difficult topics like racism. Because if we rush to action, if we rush to the doing, we risk perpetuating the status quo or unintentionally reinforcing racist social norms and structures or further dehumanizing the people who moved us to act in the first place. So how do we know that our actions are beneficial and helpful for everyone involved? Our answer is compassion. We do this by cultivating compassion. And so there are three core concepts to cultivating compassion. Um, there's more, but that's about all we have time for right now. So the first is that we all have a compassionate core. That at the center of who we are is a core self that's capable of engaging in radical compassion to embrace other people and engage in conversations. That is capable of courage, that is capable of connection and relationship, that it's kind, that's capable of loving one another. And that this is who we are in our natural state. We are naturally compassionate people. But, oh, and, and, to, and to think about who you are, your core self, this may be kind of a new concept. It's those moments in your life when you felt most alive, when you felt most like you. It's, it's those moments where if, if, if I came up to you and asked you, tell me about you, who are you? These are the moments that you would share with me that, so that I would know who you are. And in those moments, you're connected with your core self. But usually when we talk about race or racism, we lose sight of our core self. We become reactive. Uh, it brings up emotions and we get embroiled in those emotions and we see those conversations through the lens of that emotion. We become enmeshed. And when this happens, we're, we're taken over by that emotion and we lose our sense of self. Uh, and the energy of that emotion really takes over our consciousness. We, our, our language reflects that. Um, I had a rough day at work today. You know, I said some really hurtful things. Why did I say those things? That's not me. That's not who I am. Or, I, you know, I feel a little off today. I don't, I don't feel quite like myself. So our intuitive language already expresses this, and the compassion practice makes it explicit. The second is to take the U-turn. So in, in moments where we're feeling reactive, we're overcome with some emotion, the invitation is to take a look within ourselves for what needs healing. And to do this, we need to get grounded because when we're caught in the emotion or in the energy of an emotion, we need to find some space from that. Because emotions, like I said, take over our, the seat of our consciousness and we lose our distinction. We become that emotion. I am angry. I am sad. Not, I notice sadness within me. I notice anger within me, but it's not the totality of who I am. I still have myself. And so we want to get grounded and get some space between the emotions that we're feeling and how we respond and react to them. When we do that, we can act with greater clarity and more easily understand the wisdom within these emotions, which is the third component, is the radical acceptance of our emotions. Every interior movement we experience is rooted in a cry of pain or a need straining to be heard. All interior movements bid for life. That's a quote from Frank. Um, so they're rooted in some need for healing. They're trying to help us flourish, but they don't always know how to express that. And when we get grounded and have some space between the emotion and our sense of ourself, we can more completely explore that and figure out what that wisdom is so that we can put it to work in the world in, in some way. And so the central point in shorthand form is that we want to treat our emotions as we would a friend in need. It's kind of an imaginal step that we have different parts of ourselves. Part of me wants to go to the store, part of me wants to stay home. And that 
we can interact with them as we would a friend in need. What, what sort of care would you offer to a friend who was going through a difficult time? That same kind of care you can offer to yourself and to these emotions that are complicating our lives. So what can you do? Um, I need to look at this here. Uh, yeah, read Frank's books. Come back in <laughs> April. He's going to talk about compassion. That's a big step. And then um, engage in contemplative practices that foster an internal and external awareness, uh, which you'll learn in Frank's books and in the talk he's going to give in April. And at the end of this um, session, we're going to do a practice. So to kind of give you a taste of how to start this process. One of the things that's going to be obvious um, as you uh, begin to uh, perhaps purchase these books and begin to study compassion is that uh, among the things you can do is honestly just to sit there and, and, and be with those reactive emotions and begin to see them as friends. Begin to see them as parts of you that need to be tended, as Seth was saying. Um, and that may sound simple. It may sound easy. Right? And I literally, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that because I think we can hear and say, oh, okay, just sit with my emotions. When your emotions are, when you're doing this with regards to race, those emotions are particularly heightened. Particularly heightened. In part because we're trying to make sense of what we feel, what makes sense of what we know and begin to try to understand the complex world we live in with regards to race. Part of the reason we use this iceberg as a kind of visual image is that engaging in conversations about race, often we want to skip to the top step to say we want to have joyful conversations. But there's all this stuff underneath that, are, that we believe is critical, essential, to laying the foundation to begin to have the conversation, right? We just can't start at the conversation. There's work we must do foundationally beginning with compassion and moving now towards learning about race and racism, right? And in, in, in doing this way and believing and, and working through this compassionately, you can begin to understand and accept the pervasive reality of racism, that it's everywhere in America, that it is everywhere in our institutions when we look around us. Our perceptions of the way the world is Everything has racial meanings and racial implications, right? If you look at the founding of this school, who was allowed to be here, who perhaps worked here, who maybe are the gardeners around here, all these things, all these things we look at through a racialized lens, right? And so the question that we have to ask when thinking about this with regards to joy and compassion is how might we find joy in seeing the Imago Dei in our racialized self and in racialized others? How might we find joy in seeing the image of God in ourself when we are dealing with the woundedness we might experience as a racialized person of color? How might we find joy when we're dealing with the guilt and shame, perhaps, that we are confronting as a person of privilege, as a white person, in dealing and in, in, in addressing these issues. And so within the, what we believe one ought to do is begin to study race, begin to learn about how race works. And there's um, three ways we want to suggest that you can begin to do that, or three kind of, um, I guess, frameworks that we use, that we use in our practice. First is critical race theory. Now, critical race theory makes explicit the structural, economic, it, it, it argues that race is structural, from an economic, political, and ideological perspective. It's embedded in the way the economy works with regards to wealth distribution and access to wealth. It's embedded in our politics, which is pretty obvious right now. And it's also embedded in our ideologies. And in this sense, we're talking about Christian ideology, right? The colonial Christian narrative. And so, what we want to do and what, what, we, what we believe you have to do is to begin to understand how racism is structural. Let's begin to center the experiences of people of color by having people of color as they, in these groups and being able to listen to those narratives and believing, in believing them, 
believing them to be true, right? Without questioning it because it's different than your experience. And so um, a, a funny example that I'm gonna share with you guys briefly. I didn't tell uh, Seth I was gonna do this, but he probably assumed. Uh, so I'm at professor at the University of San Diego. Um, I had to move to San Diego a few years ago to rent a property. And um, as you can imagine, um, property in San Diego, even for rental property, is really competitive because, you know, it's like 70 degrees every day and we're by the beach and it's really nice and, you know, got the best weather in the world and whatnot. So, hey, you know, it's hard to, hard to find a property. And so I'm applying to rent at all kinds of apartments, just put in applications. And there's one we go to that I kind of like. It's in a good neighborhood. And so I walk in and Seth is with me and I'm looking around and I start I tell, start telling the, the, the person who's showing the property about myself. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm Reverend Dr. Christopher Carter. I work at the University of San Diego. I just finished my dissertation. I'm doing work in the community. And I'm really talking about all the ways in which they can trust me as a black person to rent that property. Like, hey, I'm one of the good ones. I'm not going to, you, you can trust me. I'm, I have a good job. I'm respected. That's what I'm doing. I know that's what I'm doing. Seth, on the other hand, has no idea what I'm doing. He's just looking at me, what are, what are you talking about? And so when we leave, he says to me, he's like, why were you bragging about all the stuff you do to this, to this lady? And I, then I had to explain to him, I was like, no, this is not bragging. This is me letting them know that they can trust me. Because the history in this country with regards to access to land and, and, and property ownership is a history of redlining, meaning I know there's certain places people don't want me to be. And so I have to show myself a certain kind of way, right? Now, you can believe that story or not, but these kinds of stories show the pervasive reality of race. Now, the other part is recognizing how race came to be, how this idea got cemented in the American consciousness, because we are all racialized. White people, people of color, we're all racialized. And racial formation helps us, it gives us a framework to begin to understand how that process worked. How certain groups became white. How white, the idea of whiteness got embedded in our social and structural system, right? I think this is really important in our current moment when we talk about immigration and the ways in which people are perceived as immigrants, as an opportunity with regards to racial formation and how we are racialized, how we are taught to connect social structure with racial reality. The same way that I was connecting the social structure of me renting a property with my racial reality as an African-American man. And the last part of racial formation that helps is it helps us distinguish what we're talking about when we're talking about racism, right? Because usually there's two competing camps with regards to race, that race is a, just an idea, something that was created, um, this, or race is purely um, biological. Right, that it's just, you know, you're born it and it stays that way, or it's just it's not an idea that we need to stop talking about to get rid of. Race, race information theory says that doesn't really matter. What matters is what's actually how we perceive the world, how we are taught about race, and how we begin to live out those experiences. And because of this, it gives us a healthy distinguish, distinction to make about racism. Some might argue that racism is only when someone does something explicitly racist or says something that's explicitly racist, right? That's how they have this narrow definition. When someone is intentionally racist. Racial formation theory builds upon critical race theory to understand that racism is also structural. And so even if a particular policy or, 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 or a program does not explicitly state it wants to marginalize people of color, if the outcome is such that people of color are marginalized and don't have access to some kind of good, then that policy is racist, right? And so it gives us the framework to even apply this to theology, to apply this to the ways in which we've constructed our youth groups and our activities. Who is excluded? Who does not have access to be in this space? Who doesn't feel comfortable being in this space? So it gives us that little bit of nudge to begin to interpret things a little bit differently. And lastly, the white racial frame. Now, the white racial frame is built upon the other two. Joe Feagan, who's the author of the book, adopts a critical race theory and racial formation approach. But it's particularly important because it helps us understand that it's white racial frame is a, a way in which we all, and I mean we all, not just white people, but we all have been taught to interpret the world through the lens of whiteness. And this helps make that explicit. Because the white racial frame is 
You can turn, or you, can, you can have parts that you accept, you can be liberal and still operate within a white racial frame of your, interpretive, your interpretation of the world. It allows us to, um, again, contribute to white denial about the reality of racism in the United States, such that people can believe that if you just work hard enough, you can succeed, or that just because someone doesn't say something that's racist means that, okay, clearly they're not racist, even though their actions would show you that they are, right? All of these things are built into what we would call the, the white racial frame. So what can you do? We want you all to first be, to, to begin to move towards talking about race. You have to learn about race. The compassion practice gives us the tools to be able to talk about race in ways that allows us to be compassionate towards ourselves with the stuff and the emotions and the reactivities that come up when we're, doing, when we're learning about it. Because right now, we're not even into the talking yet, but just to the learning, <laughs> just to the reading, just to the engaging. We have, to, we have to tend to our emotions that come up compassionately. So these are some resources we think that are helpful. Those resources are in the uh, handouts that are on the, the table right there. Um, I, I love, if you haven't heard the podcast Code Switch, it's amazing. They cover all kinds of stuff. I want to point and just point out briefly um, the idea of the implicit association test, just to say that this test is not something you should do to take to determine if you're racist. Because often it's used in anti-racism training to say, well, if I, did a, if I scored good on this, if I have no bias, then I'm not racist. Or if I'm biased towards black people, then I'm not racist. It's not about that. What we want you to do is to take the test and then ask yourself how you feel about your results. It's not about the results. It's about your reactivity to the results. Right? What comes up within you? This is where you can do the U-turn and talk about compassion and begin to tend to the stuff that comes up with how you have portrayed yourself with regards to that test. You're going to click this on. So creating the space is the next pillar of our program. That when, when we're getting into spaces where we're talking about race, we need, we need to create it. We need to set the space somehow. Because um, if we don't create the space, our youth will be too stressed out to learn. Uh, and they will be physiologically incapable of taking in new information. Like there's a lot of research that backs this up, that uh, you need, it's a bell curve of stress. And so if you're too stressed, you actually can't learn new information. You can't take anything in. And if you're kind of a couch potato, you can't learn either because you're not doing enough to be able to learn. And so you need to be right in the middle. Um, and so setting the space helps establish um, that this is going to be stressful enough, but not too stressful. So ways that you can do that, in preparing for this, we realized that as youth leaders, you have uh, an environment and have a context that Chris and I don't have and have been yearning for, to be honest. Um, the diversity model is we'll come talk about race for an hour and then racism will be fixed, right? So obviously what we're saying here is it's, this is going to take more substantial effort and time. Youth groups meet regularly over time, and you already have a rapport with your, uh, with your youth group. And so this is critical um, to be able to create this space. So we can lean into that. You can lean into that, that you already have trust and familiarity with, with your youth. Another way that you can begin establishing trust and rapport, though, is to model vulnerability. So share your own stories of, of your racial journey. So moving from a sage on the stage to a guide on the side, that you're co-journeying with them, and you're facilitating this journey, but you're also part of this journey. Um, holding the space then also becomes important. That youth leaders, oh, I have another slide for this, okay. That you as youth leaders need to remain grounded. So facilitating this kind of work, you have to remain grounded. And if you're not in this space, your youth will know it, and they'll react accordingly. If, if we don't feel safe enough to engage this, then we're not going to open up. We're not going to reflect. So remaining grounded is crucial. But it's not only your responsibility to hold the space. It's the responsibility of everyone hold, that, that's present to hold that space together. And so we do this by creating shared codes of conduct. Um, creating the codes of conduct together helps 
uh, give responsibility to youth. It helps them feel like they're in charge of what's going on as well, that they have some agency in this, which was last. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, and so the way we go about creating this is asking, what, what do you need to feel courageous, courageous enough and curious enough to engage this kind of work? What, what would help you feel safe enough to explore this work together? Um, Spaces can't always be safe, but they can be compassionate. And so that's what we're trying to create. And then finally, um, welcoming everyone's emotions. That at our core, our emotions have some wisdom. And so we want to acknowledge that. And acknowledge that we're trying to seek what that is. It, it may not be apparent. We may not know what it is. It may not even feel like there's wisdom in this terribly chaotic emotion I'm feeling. But we know that there is. And so we want to welcome it into the space. And so we're going to do a practice later that actually gets more at this and is a practice that you all can take with you if you want. Um, so that's. So, so, as we continue to move up the iceberg, now we're at discerning action. What do we do? How do we put these practices that we've been discussing in action so we can move towards joyful conversations about race? And so, as we begin to talk about compassion and learning about the complexities of race and then trying to create the space in your groups to have these conversations just to create the space to be able to talk about it. The question I'd like to pose to you is, how are you as a youth leader deepening your understanding of your own racialization? Right? So I know as a, as a pastor, one of the fundamental things I learned when I was in seminary that has proven to be undeniably true is that I have to work on the depth of my own spirituality and my own discipleship, if I'm going to model that to my congregation. That the deeper my own spirituality grows, the way in which I grow more in love with Christ, that is reflected in my relationship with my congregation. Similarly, if you want to talk about race, if you, want, if you think race is important enough to be discussed in your groups or in your classes, you got to do the work. You got to begin to learn. You got to dig deep to begin to understand the way in which it operates within you first, before you move towards having conversations, especially with youth, but in general, I would suggest. Conversations where you are trying to uh, perhaps show yourself as a, as a leader, I guess I should say, right? And so I would suggest that if you aren't working to understand how your racialization shapes your worldview, then or perhaps could fall victim to, to framing things and explaining uh, things through the lens of your own reactivity, right? Through the lens that you've created, the particular kind of bias that we all have that's reactive to certain topics and certain agendas and certain ideas because you haven't done the work to cultivate compassion so that when that comes up, you know you're being reactive to it. And so ultimately, to be able to do this work, it has to be a part of who you are. It has to be authentically you. And I believe that when you begin to explore your own racialization compassionately, it becomes a part of who you are. It becomes a part of how you see the world. You begin to see how race is structured and explicit and pervasive in our world, and you can't help but see race in everything. And I, I should be clear here, I don't want to say that um, to the exclusion of other things like gender or like sexuality, because that's, that's, that's there too. But clearly, we have a history, 400 years of history in this country, of the way in which slavery, 600 years thinking about genocide, of the ways in which race has framed how we see each other. And so when we're having these uh, interactions, we need to be mindful of how our actions, our conversations, our ways of being in the world promote joy by affirming another one's identity, who they are not questioning their story, not questioning their authenticity, but affirming their concrete reality in order to give them the opportunity to experience joy that they may have been denied. And so when discerning compassion action within your groups, we think it takes among the following forms. I wanna just briefly highlight um, two, empowerment and justice. What justice does is justice makes sure that uh, it, again, is, is it resists the charity model Right? It focuses on empowering and making sure that in doing the work of anti-racism or, or doing the work of, of talking about race, you're not creating power dynamics where there's a, a tacit kind of attachment to uh, uh, people of privilege, to um, perhaps people of color. 
right? So make sure that you're actually empowering the community to do the work that they already would be able to do if they were properly equipped and funded. So actions you can take in your groups. Contemplative practices that, again, we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, perhaps actually have a sermon series or one of these uh, pedagogical strategies where you actually look at um, you know, passages and, and narratives that have been uh, really important within the uh, African-American Christian tradition or the Asian-American Christian tradition or just whatever other group that's not a part of the dominant culture, right? Uh, lastly, oh, the other thing I want to briefly, intercultural activities that bring to light cultural assumptions, right? So this isn't just going to Mexico to build a house. It's going to Mexico. It's finding out why the people there don't have money or access to land, what kind of policies are in place that are inhibiting them from flourishing, how might our theologies be shaped such that we can begin to fix this, address the problem, right? So it, it goes deeper than just we're gonna go somewhere and have some good Mexican food and fix a house and feel good about ourselves. Now I love good Mexican food, but we can do better than that, right? And lastly, do this work in small groups, among yourselves, right? Get folks together that want to talk about this. That's, that's how this started with Seth and I. Seth said, I want to be able to talk about this with someone that I know isn't going to shame me or judge me because I have really dumb questions. And his questions weren't that dumb. But it was nice of him to ask me and nice of him to say it. It started a, a long journey for the last 10 years that we've gotten to this point right now. And so forming those groups, you know, to be able to do this kind of work, I think, is, 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 is critical. I think you have to wrap up end with the story. Okay, and then, no, 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 I think. So then conversations as compassionate acts. Joyful conversations. So what kind of conversations are we trying to have because usually when we talk about having conversations, we think more of debate, right? We expect to be defensive. We want to make our point heard, rather than going in with a mindset of learning and engaging the conversation as a springboard to action, or to forming relationships, or to being changed in some way. So it's a problem of intent. When we have conversations without the intent to act on the knowledge that we've learned from one another, we perpetuate the status quo. When our, in when our intent is rather to humanize our conversation partner. We open up the possibility of relational connection and transformation. Joyful conversations become possible. And so I want to share with you a, a bit about my own journey and how this work has transformed the way I interact with and understand my own emotions. Um, when we began this work, we quickly realized that I didn't know enough about race. I needed to learn more about race to be able to productively create this program. And so I shifted my coursework to focus more on race. I focused my exams on race and my dissertation heavily focused on race. It's, it's this program was the focus of my dissertation. And so as I began reading about critical race theory and racial formation, um, it brought up a lot of emotions, anger, embarrassment, frustration, shame, guilt. And I, I'd become so embroiled in these emotions, I, I, didn't, I didn't really know what to do. Uh, I'd, I'd start to be overwhelmed, and I'd, I'd want to burn out. I'd quit. I'd want to quit. I didn't have to focus on race. I wanted to do board games and spirituality. It's just as interesting to me. And so when these emotions would peak, I would call Chris, and I'd say, Chris, I'm just so overcome with these emotions, I don't know what to do. I, I, I feel like they're eating me up and I'm going to burn out. And he'd say, yeah, I know what you mean. I hear you. This is really difficult work, but you're not alone. Or I'd go to church where my wife and I worshipped with an African-American congregation in Compton. And I'd play music with the choir, or I'd listen to one of Chris's sermons, or join in fellowship after the service. And held in that compassionate space, I'd feel resuscitated. I'd feel more alive. I'd come back to myself, and I'd feel motivated and engaged. Like I could carry on with this work. I could continue doing it. And I realized 
as I kept reading that Chris doesn't get to turn away, that my, my church family doesn't get to turn away. People of color don't get to run from race. So neither do I. I don't get to run. And that was my first act of solidarity. So then as I kept reading, these emotions were still present, but I can no longer run from them. So I leaned into the compassion practice because I needed a way to tend to these emotions. And as I stayed with this, I realized that these emotions, weren't, they weren't the harbingers of doom I thought they were. They weren't blocking or obstructing my path. They were guiding my feet as I run this race. So I don't run it in vain. And I knew that this was the key. Because every time I'd have a feeling of shame or guilt, I realized it was connected to some racist motivation within me, or intent, or action, or thought. But how many times in the past had I done the same things and never realized it? and never knew that I was doing anything racist. But now, because I'm aware of it, I can change my behavior. I can begin to do things differently. And so these emotions that I thought were trying to block my path were guiding my path. They were guiding me to joy. Every time I have these emotions, I can take a step towards liberation. I can take a step towards joy. And that's why we do this work. That's why we think of this work as joy work. So thank you. I want to thank Dr. Rogers, Dr. Carter, Dr. Shane for an incredible and seminal conversation in our community. Uh, it's not really a time for jokes, but since I'm so poorly formed and bad mannered, I said to them when they came, You've spent your whole life on this, developing this model. What a shame that we've solved this problem in our society and your work is no longer needed. <laughs> but of course we haven't. And in fact, I think a great deal of heart sickness over the last 10 years is that we wonder if we're going in the wrong direction, uh, if we had thought that we were moving in the right direction. So this is important work. And I don't think our youth are less open to this. I think our youth are more open to this and open in a way that can not only enrich the life of your congregation, it can model life for your congregation. So we need to stop now because we keep covenant with you. We know students have to go to 120 classes and you're late. And we know that some of you, many of you are tent workers, tent making pastors, you have jobs to go to. So if you need to leave, uh, please go with our gratitude and thanks for joining us. Please come back and join us the first Wednesday of November for David Anderson Hooker and team's presentation on peacemaking and reconciliation. Please like us on Facebook so we can communicate with you by that medium or the other social media. And now we're gonna encourage those who can stay to a rich period of question and answers, and we have all the caffeine and sweets that you need to power you through that conversation. Thank you for joining us. We'll take a couple of minutes. Yeah.
Okay, you guys ready to go back to work? Okay, brothers and sisters, we are going to continue now with questions and answers of our scholars. And I want to just remind you that our live audience around the world can't hear your question because you're not mic'd. So if you would like to ask a question, just please let me know, raise your hand, and I'll bring the mic to you. Oh we, oh, we have questions. Oh, we do have questions. Yes, ma'am. Chris? Hello. Um, my question is, it's so wonderful that we all want to help the youth of the world. But sometimes helping the youth starts with the parents who may not want to enter into these conversations at all from everything from their own trauma to facing, as you said, their own... Um, concerns about where they are, maybe being afraid of it, maybe being out about what they think. And if the parents shut down, the kid can shut down. Yeah. That's my question. So how do we go to the parents and work with them too and make them partners in this? So I teach a course on, well, all my courses engage race, but I specifically teach a course called Black and Womanist Theologies that at a predominantly white institution. And so my, and so my students are unpacking these issues and having conversations, because I make them write a biography where they have to talk about the racialization. And it um, always, I, I've had interesting conversations with students after that happens when they have to tell their parents what they wrote. Um, and it brings up a lot of what you talked about. I have the benefit that they're not living with their parents. And so that, that makes a big difference. That makes a big difference. So I just want to preface that by saying um, I think that. This is, if, if I were a youth pastor and I was going to do this work, I would make sure I've laid the groundwork as best I can within my group before I deeply engage it so that my youth felt comfortable talking about it. I would, be in, I would communicate with the parents that were going to discuss it, but focus on the youth. And, and, and you have, with the full awareness that parents may obviously want to know what you're talking about and begin to unpack it, but trust the agency of the young person, that this is important to them and matters to them, and that they can be, continue to be in conversation with their friends. It would be great if parents wanted to participate and then do something separate, like with them, themselves, without their kids. But that may not happen. But I don't think that means we shouldn't do it, right? I think my, the ideal would be for parents to say, you know, this is a really good idea. I wish maybe we should do this work too. Um, or at, at best, or I guess I say at least, just not, not resist you doing the work. Um, if parents are, if you have a particular parent that's really resistant to it, I'll probably bet that child probably really longs for it because that's probably what they're experiencing at home. Um, and again, I think one of the things I, I tell Frank that, and, and Seth that we've learned is so many times I have conversations with, with people that disagree with me, I go back to that compassion practice. I go back to seeing what's coming up in me when I'm having a conversation with them to help them stay grounded and try to help them unpack what they're actually really feeling. Because maybe they're just, you know, I don't know what their nervousness is, but there's something underneath there that um, I as a clergy person want to help them unpack and uncover. And that's like a mediocre answer to your question. <laughs> I feel like. I, because honestly, I, 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 if it were me, I would do the work in my group and I would just be in communication with the parents because I think, I think it's that important. And my experience in working with youth and, and, and young people is that they, they want to do this work. They want to do this work. Um, and I would be surprised if a parent really wanted to like maybe take their kid out of a youth group because they were doing this kind of work, especially if it's framed in compassion. 
Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, she works, they, she says she works in a school, so it's a little bit different. And so they have to be there, which in some ways is nice, because they have to be there. Thank you, thank you for your question, that's a great question. Uh, so I'm a pastor in one town over in Hamden, Connecticut, and uh, it's a pretty uh, diverse community uh, on Connecticut standards, at least. Uh, and it, uh, but it is pretty segregated by neighborhood. And currently, the Board of Education is considering uh, redistricting options for their elementary schools to try, on the one hand, to try and address some of the budgetary issues they have. On the other hand, they're saying it's also about uh, aligning the uh, uh, demographic uh, percentages to be more equitable. Uh, so I'm curious to hear if you have any thoughts for us on the church's role in these kind of situations, uh, how we can advocate for the most uh, just anti-racist options that don't put, uh, that don't traumatize and uproot communities of color, but also help us be a uh, better, in better integrated community. I have thoughts on everything, yeah, but no, I don't have anything, yeah. So. I'm a silent fan. So the nature of our relationship is I say stuff, and then he, he adds to what I say, and then sometimes I have to remind each other. It's just kind of how it works. Um, I would, so is the church you're at predominantly white? It's a predom yeah, predominantly white church. Um, I would create the space for people to come and have conversations. I would host something so people can come and talk about how they feel about what's happening. Give them the space to express themselves and what's going on, right? And how they feel about what's going on. I wouldn't make any assumptions about anything, right? So people can say, this is how I feel about what's happening. This is how I feel it may affect my community. This is the stuff that's coming up within me, right? Or, you know, and, and this is again where I, I, we go back to the compassion practice where I think those resources and tools helps you, if you're gonna host this space, stay grounded in the midst of a lot of things that's getting shared, right? In terms of discerning compassionate action, right, which I hear you saying, what's the next thing to do? This is where I say, listen to what the people want, right? Like, depending on what the community may want, uh, what choices they believe ought be made and what ought not be made, um, and try to empower them to do that work. Give them a platform, right? If you're a predominantly white church and you have these small churches of color, uh, or churches that are probably have people of color, and, and, and Use your privilege in ways to help dismantle that racist structure. Amplify their voice, right? Because you don't necessarily have to be the voice, but you, if, you have a, if you have access to a platform to amplify their voice, right, that would be a compassionate act. Does, does that begin to answer a little bit? All right, thank you. Thank you for that question. It was great. There was a comment you made about... Um, your emotions as your friends. So how do you see your emotion, emotions as your friends, especially if they're raw and hurtful? Yeah, so it goes back to getting that, that grounding and getting a space. Because if you're feeling those raw and hurtful emotions, there's no, usually no separation between who you are and who those emotions are. Uh, and so the goal there is, is to get grounded, to sort of do something that helps you come back to yourself, right? Go for a walk, play sports, wh whatever you do to, that makes you feel more like yourself. And then once you have the time to settle a little like that and aren't so enmeshed in that hurt emotion, that um, then you have this, you've created some space to be able to interact with that emotion. Um, just like you tending to a friend, if you're caught up in your own reactivity around what they're talking about, you can't be there for your friend. You can't offer care if their care is triggering you. Is that, is that, is that help? Okay. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's, it's, it's as simple as um, one of the things that, that, that Seth does when we do these workshops is to talk about the difference between saying um, there's anger with, within me yeah. and I am ang angry, right? Because the entirety of you is not, like you are not angry, right? But there is a part of you that is angry. There is anger within you. And that gives you the space to be able to say, okay, I, the totality of my being is not anger. The totality of my being is not frustration or hurt or harm. It's a part of me. So I can have some distance from it to, to look at it. And honestly, that for, just so you have a window to my practice, I talk to it, whatever it is, you know, with compassion. And so then it gives me that visual 
separation. So I'm not enmeshed in it. But the grounding piece, that's, yeah. like, that's fundamentally, that's critical. To have that, that grounding piece, but take the U-turn to, to talk to that part. Good afternoon, I'm J.P. Morgan, the one without the money. <laughs> but I have two... I, I was hoping you were the other one. <laughs> right, right, yes, yes, I wish. I have two points to address. We are generally taught to not to embrace those things that we don't like about ourselves. And today at this presentation, which I think was awesome, we are hearing that we must love the things that we don't like about ourselves. So I'd like for any one of the presenters to speak more on that, and also to Dr. Carter. You laid out your credentials in seeking this apartment. Ultimately, did you get the apartment? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll quickly answer the second question. Uh, I decided to get another apartment. And so, but I, was, I, was, I had the opportunity to get the apartment. Like, I had to turn them down which is the position I wanted to be in, yes. right? Yeah. So I can look at other places and pick the best one. So thank you, I should, say, I should put that in the story. I didn't even think about that. Um, and the, 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 the previous question was, how do we love the parts that we don't like? Um, do you wanna talk about that piece? Or do you want, you want me to? Yeah, his, yeah, about the compassion. For, um, um, so, uh, let me get clear on the question again. How do, we love, how do we love the parts of ourselves that we don't like? What do we mean by that? Uh, yeah, 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 so, yeah. So we don't like those dark parts of ourselves um, is the question. So those dark parts of ourselves at their core, this is, this is the radical assumption of the compassion practice. They're not dark. There's, there's something at the core that's yearning for healing um, and that's trying to help us flourish. Um, I couldn't get into the, the framework and the theory that we use, but um, oftentimes those parts come from our childhood. And so they still have a child's mind for how to help us do things in the world now, right? So children will scream and yell to get their way sometimes because they don't have the capacity to do that otherwise. They, have, they haven't learned that yet. And so our parts will shout and yell and scream, meaning the manifestation, how the, the behavior of, of our parts can sometimes be reprehensible. But at its core, there's something yearning for flourishing. And so learning what that is, um, is, is key to transforming how we relate to that part. And this is where compassion, I think, is critical to tend to that wound, right? Because you can look at that woundedness and be ashamed of it and have a sense of guilt or anger. But what we're suggesting is that you approach that, that, that woundedness with compassion, that you allow yourself to be distanced from it enough to, to, to say, to try and discern what's underneath it, what, what, what fear might it have, what longing does it have, what aching wound does it have, right? I'm forgetting the last one. Gift stifled. Gift stifled, yep. Um, what, what gift is it trying to enliven that it isn't able to? And then when you can begin to discern that piece, and so this isn't guess, a, a love that is, um, as Bonhoeffer might say, like cheap grace. No, it, it is a deep kind of love that allows you to engage it in a way to try to begin to allow it to heal, you know? Um, and so I think that's what we're trying to get around, talking about loving that, those parts. Thank you for that question. That's a great question. Yeah, it really is. Hi. Uh, you talked a little bit about, you know, asking ourselves how, how do my actions promote joy in others by affirming their identity? And you talked about authenticity in this, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how, you know, as, as white youth leaders, we can sort of approach the issue of race with minority students uh, in ways that aren't problematic or uncomfortable for them while we sort of acknowledge and affirm their race. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, that's a really good question. Um, and so it begins with, for white people with humility, understanding that we don't know everything we need to know about race to be able to address race effectively. So by nature of being a person of color, they have an experience and a wisdom about how race functions that we don't have as white people. So begin by inviting the, the, um, your youth of color to share some of those experiences if they want to. Don't force them to, if it, invite them to do it. Um, and 
to not position yourself as, as like the all-knowing leader, basically. Um, and, and Chris, do you have anything else? Yeah, then? the other thing I'll say is, as a, as a, and one of the things I think you do that Seth does, I think, really well when we are in the space doing this stuff in the classroom is Seth models a, a kind of compassionate awareness of what's going on in the world. So, because the thing is, you have to signal to students of color that they can talk to you about this stuff. Because there are, my, I would suggest they're probably going to be, they're going to have the assumption that they can't. Or they only can talk to you about certain things. They know what they can and cannot say. And so your behavior, the things you, you talk about, your awareness of the particular injustices that happen in, in uh, the communities of color, and articulating that those are, are, are justice issues helps them know, okay, this person actually cares about this stuff. So then when they do begin to talk to you about it, you can do exactly what, 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 what Seth said, and approach it with humility. Yeah, and, 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 and affirming yeah. their particular story as true, and center it, right? in such a way that you allow them to feel that their concrete reality is truth. Because so often through the white racial frame, they've been told that their experience is a lie. And what they think they're experiencing isn't really their experience. It's, it, it's something that, that has been just made up and it's just an excuse for them to um, like cop out and not work hard and all the other kind of narratives that we've created around racism, right? And so you wanna counter that. That I believe is affirming not only joy, but also, again, the, the fact that they are, you know, they bear the Imago Dei, right? That they are sacred, unique, beautiful people. So thank, yeah, thank you for asking that, was, that. That was a really good question. I thought of something. You have to earn their credibility. Uh, if, you're, if you're speaking to an audience of, that involves people of color, you have to earn their credibility. You don't automatically get it. And part of the way whiteness works is I'm used to going to, into any situation and being assumed that I'm capable of talking about what I'm talking about, that I'm intelligent, that I know it. And that doesn't always exist with people of color, and rightly so. Um, so that's a big part of what I try to do, is establish that it's sort of strange that I'm up here talking about this, and um, not presenting myself as um, a guru or something. Or an expert. Or an expert. Uh, and so working to earn that credibility. And you do that by welcoming their emotions and saying, I know that there's resistance here, and that's really, really important because that helps keep me honest and real. And so inviting that into this space is, is really important. Thank you for that question. Yeah. I really hope you can do that. One more question. Hi. Hello. Hi. How do you engage compassionately with someone, uh, a student or someone, a white person that's outwardly racist and that could be, you know, would be hurting others in the space? So the easiest question last then? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, so their, first of all, their reactions are also coming from their own woundedness. And that they also have a compassionate core within them um, that is being blinded, we're blind too because of their racist reactions. Um, so getting to a place where you can see that, and that's not easy, um, is how that begins and helping them to feel heard. When, when we feel heard, we calm down, right? Our, our emotions relax. And so helping them to feel heard is going to help them calm down and um, maybe begin to be able to reflect more on that. Sometimes when people are so chaotic and um, sequestering is the most compassionate thing that we can do, is removing them from the situation. That may be a compassionate act in certain contexts. Um, because violation is not acceptable. So, so as an example, I, had a, I teach a, a class called Christian Social Ethics, and one of the sections we talk about eco economics and, and capitalism, and one student from my business school, and I don't want to disparage business schools, I have a business degree, but typically the business school students are the ones who harbor certain kinds of biases that are embedded, quite honestly, in capitalism, right? And this is what this conversation was. It, it, it was about um, development. <clears throat> and a student said, you know, that part of the reason that he's, they're skeptical about the development taking place in, 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 in developing countries like in places in Africa is that the inability for these countries to, you know, like organize themselves and get things together. And, and, and you know, this is not, this is, this is, not unheard of for soon I have this kind of thought, right? And so what I did, I said, you know, yes, I can totally see how it may, you may feel that way, right? That, that, that this country at its current state seems as though it's in its perpetual state of development. That is how it looks. I totally, I, I see that. But I, I, I wonder, 
how do you know how it got there? Right? And so then it gives that, just turn it like that by affirming their very racist question <laughs> in a way such that I'm like, well, how did it get there? And they don't really know. So I'm like, well, you know, you have what we call colonization. <laughs> you know, and then I can begin laying out the ways in which things happen to where we got to this point right now, right? So then I can do the work as the teacher, because what I don't want to do is my students of color if like, they have to respond to the racist stuff. That's not their job, right? It, it's, it's my job as a professor. And so I want to help that student, I want to approach it compassionately, I want to help that student become aware of their bias by helping them unpack it and do the, and do the work with me. I'm not just going to do it for them, right? So that way, because what I want, what I, essentially what I want them to do, I'm trying to teach them the U-turn. I'm trying to teach them that when I think something that is racist, I need to ask, well, why am I thinking this, right? Rather than, because racism, we like to think racism is out there. You know, racism is not just out there. Racism is in us and all around because we embody these kinds of racist structures. And so I want, when that question comes, ultimately the best thing you want to do is students to teach them eventually to be able to be like, whoop, what's going on in me that's making me say racist things? Th thank you for that question. That's a good way to wrap it up. Let's thank our speakers again for a wonderful talk. And in closing, I just want to emphasize one of the things that uh, Seth and Chris commented on. You can imagine their program, their wisdom, as a 10th grade intervention. It comes on the second and third Tuesdays of uh, February in health class. No trust, no relationships, no caring, no affirmation. People sometimes say, why do we need to work on youth ministry? Why should our trustees invest in it? Why should parents bring them? Why should the kids come? Why should I do this? Only a church can embrace baptisans and their parents at birth, welcome them into a community oriented around these values, embed them in the practices of the faith and the story of Jesus and his compassion, and form a community that goes for 23 years in a multi-generational context. This is good work in any context. Our context is an unbelievably blessed place for this work. So thank you for your chat today. Thank you all. See you next month for David Anderson Hooker.